I'd like to introduce our three panelists. We have our very own Oshin Boydell from right here in Ireland. He, he's a data scientist with uh, CDAR and UCD, and he, he spoke earlier this, this, this afternoon. Um, so Oshin's background is in data analytics, machine learning, personalization, and recommender systems. And he spoke about machine learning, AI, and differenti differentiating between the hype and reality. We have Kim Nielsen from the CEO and founder of uh, Pivigo, based in the UK. Am I correct? Yep. And uh, with a PhD in astrophysics and an MBA from Cranfield School of Management. Um, she, she has given a talk as well today, and her talk was on From Data Dinosaurs to Data Stars in Five Weeks, Lessons from Competing completing 120 data science projects, so we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, and Pivigo is a data science hub our marketplace based in London. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. And, I, and John Elder is no stranger to us here in Predict, <laughs> <laughs> having spoken at the, the previous three events. So welcome back again. John is, of course, based in the US, and he leads one, the US largest and most established data mining consulting firm, Elder Research, um, with offices up and down the East Coast. <laughs> um, John is running his workshop tomorrow, um, uh, Core Machine Learning and Data Science Techniques, which will be hosted in the Herbert Park Hotel right beside us here. Um, so still tickets available. I highly recommend it. I'm going myself, so looking forward to that. So, um, so without further ado, let's, uh, I have some questions here from um, the curated uh, information that we've gathered throughout the day from Twitter and from, from interesting talks. Um, so. These are open to whoever. Um, so, so starting out, um, I guess, um, what struck you? Anything unusual or new in Predict 2018 that struck you that you might have thought unusual or you didn't expect? Anything you'd like to comment on? Who'd like to take that? <laughs> sure. Um, Machine, go yeah. uh, well, one of the things I noticed was that there was four talks today with the word hype in the title, including my own. <laughs> so I think, you know, one of the things that I noticed is, you know, this use of the word hype around um, AI and data science. Yep. And there's a sort of need, I think, from people to kind of understand mm -hmm. what is the hype and, mm -hmm. you know, what is the reality. Uh, yeah. and, and that was definitely a consistent theme that I, that I noticed yeah. across a number of talks today. And that's what Predict is all about, isn't it? Trying to demystify and debunk the hype and, and really get down to the real practical applications. And I think we saw some great ones just a moment ago with the biomonitoring and the, the devices that design partners are creating. Really practical and working uh, solutions that are delivering. Any other thoughts from Kim or John? I was particularly happy in this very last talk as well to hear about um, the word empathy used. Mm -hmm. So I think that is going to be, it's not yet very much talked about in our data science community, but I think it's a topic we should talk a lot more about, is how we can become more empathetic with whoever is going to be the end user of the algorithms that we create and so on. So I think that is going to be a topic to look out for in the future and to discuss more. Yeah. John, any comments or thoughts? Uh, there were a lot of good talks, and I like the ones that combined uh, business issues along with the technological. Uh, Kim's was particularly good in that. He'd done a lot of successful projects and was outlining the path you have to take and the stakeholders involved very efficiently. I, I love that talk. Uh, the, because we've learned over the years that obviously the technology is extremely important, but the main killer of a project is the resistance to change. It's people related. The biggest danger is, is other people and not the technology risk. Yeah, and I think that's where the whole concept of design has really tried to play into that. And I love the way uh, Cormac said, you know, you have all this data and at the end of the day, the, the, the system just says, great job, well done. And all of us data scientists are thinking, but look at all the data you could have presented in <laughs> graphs and tables and charts. But all they, all they want to know is, good, you've done well today. So I had to, I had to get rid defying. of my Fitbit. It was, it was in charge of me instead of the other way around. <laughs> yeah. You know, all that gamification and metrics, yeah, it's yeah. Too, too attractive. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. So with, uh, another uh, topic that came up today um, that wasn't actually prominent in previous ones was the concept of dark data, or people call it black data. So that was new to me. I don't know if you guys would have any thoughts on that or what that might be from an organization's ability to do data science. Any thoughts on that one? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> Must have missed that talk. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the definition of it is. Yeah. But of course, every organization will have large um, pools of hidden data yeah, yeah, yeah. that exists out there. And um, I, actually, one of the points that I was trying to make was that often an organization starts thinking they have data, but when it comes down to it, where is it, who owns it, who's, who's got the keys to that locker essentially, and are they willing to hand it over, and, and that's a big challenge. Yeah, exactly. and, the, and there are always surprises in data. I think one defini I, the definition I made up for big data is it's data nobody's looked at. So, you know, they have data, they have myths about their data, and then you finally look at it and, and you discover uh, artifacts that sometimes are more important than the models themselves about how their business, uh, maybe a flaw in their business or something. So there's a lot uh, that we can add to a company even before we model or forecast just to understanding what they have. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that the context, in the context of unstructured data as well, and huge silos of opaque data where there isn't really much kind of understanding to, to start to kind of yeah. uh, get an edge on it, uh, that, that's a perennial kind of issue. Yeah, I think data is is key and I think earlier this morning we talked about is it about smart models or smart people getting smart data into their models and I think these days there's models all over the place there's data robot that can run a hundred models against your data set so you have to be very careful with with the data you choose and um, that's where the real thinking comes in and spotting those small anomalies that might lead you to a, a big insight uh, or else it just might be bad data that is meaningless, <laughs> and that's the interpretation and of data that, is key. To know it's an anomaly, you have to have some domain knowledge. So you have to be in close cooperation with the folks who have the business, which isn't possible if they see you as a threat or, you know, so there's all these human factors that you have to take into account to really have success. And in previous years, John, you talked about um, delivering projects that were technically successful um, to large uh, companies, often uh, that had good actionable insights, but unfortunately, um, they sat on the shelf. Maybe you could tell us why, and, and have you experienced that becoming less of a problem since the, the few years ago when you talked about it? Well, that's the biggest problem we've ever faced. In our first decade, two-thirds... 90% of our projects worked technically, but only two-thirds of them were implemented. And our second decade is closer to 100% because we choose our clients better. <laughs> and, uh, and then about 90% are implemented. So we've really come a long way. I think in the industry, it's more like only a third are implemented. I remember when Microsoft, they were talking with me, and they were astonished that I had two-thirds of them implemented because internally, they were only getting a third of them actually implemented, which is astounding. If you think about this expensive meal a chef has prepared, customized for a patron who likes it, pays for it, and then you find it scraped off into the trash at the end of the night. You know, what's going on? So it's these human factors of, of lack of trust in you, lack of trust in the model, change, fear to what's going to happen to them. And these cognitive, dis, cognitive biases uh, are something that are extremely important, uh, probably more important than the technology. Once you reach a certain level of competence in the technology, you really need people who speak human. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts on, have you, any of you, either of you experienced that same thing with a really good technical project, you're delighted with the output, but all of a sudden the engagement with the end client yeah. or whatever, for some reason it doesn't engage. I, I guess CDAR sees that as well with all these demonstrators and yeah. trying yeah. to get them out there into the marketplace. That's right, so we see that from yeah. a number of different perspectives and yeah. in some scenarios as well, a company might want to do a particular demonstrator project of some sort of quite out there idea that they have, yeah. uh, which is you know really exciting for them to work on and work on their data and show these kind of possibilities, but it mightn't be something that really aligns with their current business at yeah. the moment, uh, and, and that's it, it could be kind of too far ahead of their current business roadmap. I think that's one of the challenges with the CDAR model is that, you know, CDAR are available for companies to go, oh, I'd like to try that out, you know, I don't have the skills, I don't have the capacity, will you try that out? And that's great, and you can try things out, but then it's really getting that back into the core business because it is, a little, by its nature, out there. Um, so it's interesting to see. Now, now Kim's done 150 projects. Yeah, that's coming to that. Five months. So how do you how do you do that? Well, in five weeks. Five weeks. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Well, it's sim it's similar style <laughs> projects um, where it's often about companies doing a proof of concept and trying something out and and yes, absolute horror stories, unfortunately, of companies that where we have delivered algorithms that we have 
shown can save the company millions of pounds or, or increase revenue by millions of pounds, and you check back a couple months later and nothing has happened. And one particular horror story where the whole company, including the CEO and the board, were super excited about it, but the CIO blocked it. Mm. Because the CIO just said, nope, doesn't fit with our systems, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, in my talk, I talked about uh, find the skeptics in the organization and try to convince them, bring them on board early, because what happened here was that no one had talked to the CIO, they'd gone ahead, done the project, and then sort of dumped it in his lap and said, get it to work. And, and there was that, that cognitive bias, you know, I don't want to do that, I want, I want to be part of it. So, yeah. Good. Um, so, um, also on that point, um, in terms of deep learning, have you seen adoption of that in the, become more mainstream, or how would you gauge the progress level of deep learning in industry? Um, are there real projects being executed successfully, or are they still in the early days of, of deep learning? Any thoughts on that? Uh. Yeah. yeah, well, I, I would say, I, I mean, I think deep learning, is, it's, like, it's hugely on the radar at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think there's a lot of tasks that it can do that just aren't really viable with maybe more, machi tr more traditional machine learning techniques. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that we have seen a lot of interest um, in that with, with Cedars members' companies as well. Um, and particularly uh, some of the, the benefits that uh, deep learning can bring in terms of uh, maybe negating the need for so much low-level feature engineering, mm -hmm. which then allows companies to apply these with less sort of very specific domain or, or data science uh, expertise if you build the right tools around that, which yeah, is yeah. something of interest. Yeah. Uh, do you see that as well over in the US? Deep learning is by far the most uh, hot topic, mm -hmm. yet I've not touched an actual application yet. But it's inevitable because it is actually powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean... As, as any time you have neural nets, the hype outweighs the reality, but the reality is still very good, and, and there will be applications very soon, I'm sure. And did you um, focus on that in your, any, of your, any of your 120 projects, Kim? One or two, one or two, yeah. but that's typically the startups that are working on the, on right. the absolute, absolute cutting edge that, that are trying to do something completely new. With any of our more established partners, no, not yet. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, keep your questions coming in on, on Twitter if you have any questions at this stage. We do, do have a little bit of time, so hash predict conf if you want to t tweet something in. I'll keep an eye as best I can. Um, still have some more here. Um, so, uh, so we talked about um, data-driven culture in organizations and um, what do you, how do you think, um, what, what steps can be taken to help companies to become more data-driven in their culture? And can they get too data-driven and lose some kind of spark of creativity within their staff or workforce that, that could be detrimental? Any thoughts on, on, on that? That's an interesting question. Get too data-driven. We're always pushing people to be more. Maybe we, yeah. maybe we can go too far. Yeah. You certainly can go too far in getting them excited about analytics, and then they, they think, oh my gosh, I can do everything. You're like, wait, wait, no. Wait, come back. You have to manage expectations a little bit. Uh, but the, the sign that they're getting more data-driven is when they start thinking about uh, investments that they want to make in terms of doing things just to get the data to see how it turns out later, you know. Uh, and, and that's, that's definitely down the line. Uh, but that's exciting when you start to see thoughts along those, those realms. And of course, you're not going to get there unless you have those, those pilot projects that get that early win uh, and, um, and get that return on investment with a measurable goal, usually doing something that they're already doing, just doing it better, faster, you know, more, more uh, accurately. Um, and then, and, and trying not to do a moonshot, trying not to do, or boil the ocean or use whatever analogy you want, trying not to do the big projects that typically have a very hard time succeeding, but do those small ones and then momentum will build. Yeah, yeah. I think we had a, a horror story of a, an organization that went too far in, in, the, in the UK in the last six months, and that's Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. And I think that's, that's actually one of the fears about going too far, is when you have an organization that is full of super smart, super focused people who just want to see, want to push the boundaries of what they can do, mm. and they don't consider the consequences of what they, what they do. They just want to solve the problem, and they don't care why they're solving it or for who. 
And, and they obviously went too far, and it brings back the question of how do we maintain empathy in our industry, and how do we maintain ethical use of data, etc. And I think everything comes down to the culture of the organization. Obviously, that was a, a toxic culture in that organization, and it, that in turn comes down from the leadership and the communication throughout the organization, and it just needs to be on point. Whether it needs to become more and more data-driven or less, uh, it's about making sure that you communicate from the top what you want to do with your data. I think ethics is becoming more understood now that the dangers of, of you know, being totally data-focused and whether you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. So I think having that ethics committee, and universities do this, you know, when you're applying for grants and there's any kind of human studies or interactions within those grants, there's usually an ethics committee that has to sign off. So I think companies are a little bit behind in that the, tech, the techies can be let do things uh, or the, the management maybe doesn't know exactly what they're doing or what data sets they're using. Are those data sets diverse enough? Are they biased? And um, what is the impact of this work? So I think um, a kind of a maturity in AI and modeling needs to arrive where, where people can have explainable AI. And we talked about explainable AI this morning as well. And then the decision makers can really understand what are they doing and should they be doing it and then have a kind of diverse group who can look at these things from an ethics point of view. I think that's going to be crucial. Um, do you have to get your stuff by ethics committees in UCD sometimes, uh, Machine? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah <laughs> of course. And I mean, yeah. with, you know, GDPR and, yeah, and yeah. Uh, these regulations, you know, it's, that, that's a measure of Absolutely. example of how important it is. And I mean, I think, yeah, the explainable AI as well, going back to the accountability yeah. of models that, you know, there's this thinking about that now, whereas yeah. maybe a number of years ago that, that wasn't really thought about so much. I think deep learning and explainable AI to me seem a bit counter... <laughs> I don't know, what, how do you call it? Uh, orthogonal, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> essentially that's the whole point of deep learning is like you just throw the data at it, it figures out all the probabilities and it's really just high-powered statistics with high-powered computers, figuring out all these probabilities that you could never really explain, but I guess you can explain the process and the data and your assumptions and then the models and how you train them. Yeah, and, and I think it's a lot to do with the context of where these models are used as well. Yeah, Some yeah. decisions that you want a model to make, yeah. you just want them as high accuracy as possible. It doesn't matter. They don't have to be explained as such. They yeah. mightn't have kind of direct impacts on people, for example, whereas others you do. So it's, it's a matter of using the right tools for the, the job there, I suppose. And, uh, and I understand that the, sometimes the explainable models are less powerful than the non potentially explainable models. So then you have the uh, dilemma whether you should be using the best model for this particular diagnosis of something or other, or should you use the explainable one, which you don't trust it as much, but you can explain it. So therefore, is there an ethical challenge <laughs> between those two ideas? And there's no harm in running them both, and then if they agree, you're, you're both happy, right? Maybe that's a choice in the future when yeah. you go to your GB, and it's like, do you, would you like the answer that is most likely to not be wrong, but yeah. maybe less likely to cor correctly diagnose you? <laughs> maybe that's a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Ask the yeah. patient, do you want the right answer, or do you want something I can explain? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It depends on what the question is, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really liked the session this morning on um, the customer journey analytics and Disney as customer experience was raised as a, a, an example of doing it right. And I think, again, um, using data to drive that and pushing some of that data to the front lines and the people who know the customer so they can interact more uh, more. Uh, powerfully, uh, with, or you know, more effectively with the customer um, is, is a great example of how think companies are thinking now, and even Disney uh, uh, is thinking like that. So um, uh, this comes to kind of the, the collaboration again between user experience, design, and data science. Um, how, how can those two things really coexist? Are, are there conflicts there sometimes, or are, 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 are there challenges in getting those two things, or are they mostly, in your experience, well aligned and you know, reinforce each, each other. Any thoughts on? The model is going to be consistent, but it doesn't have any common sense. You can't look at the situation. I was a, a year or two ago, United Airlines ended up like handcuffing somebody and taking them off the plane when you know, if they just raised the amount they were willing to offer volunteers, they wouldn't have lost millions of dollars in stock value after this horrific episode, you know. And, and yet the, the employees were actually following the manual 
they were following the algorithm of what to do because that company had put a lot of emphasis on standardization of, of processes and so forth and no one felt armed to make a judgment call at that point. So if your people are really good, you want to give them as much power as possible and where you uh, have less capable people, you need the, you need the thing. But it's, it's definitely... It's definitely a judgment call all the time. Yeah, and combining those two things, the computer and the human at the, who are, is at the cutting edge and has really good decision-making capability, like you said in that example, you know, it just makes sense. So, but unfortunately, the computer says no is a kind of a, a phenomenon these days. If you're no. at the checkout at one minute past 10 and you're trying to buy a bottle of wine and the computer says no, simply can't pay for it because the checkout says no. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, any other thoughts on that coexistence of user experience design and, and data science in, in your experience, Kim, in, in the projects you've been doing? You see it as important? Uh. Yeah, so most of our projects sort of end before, well, at the algorithm stage, before it actually goes out mm -hmm. to a user. Um, and I thought, it, again, it was very interesting from the very last presentation now about the, the, the thing that maybe you just have to tell people you're doing all right. <laughs> That's all they need to know, and I think it is. There, there's there's something we need to balance there because on one hand we have to make the outcome, the insight, easily accessible to the users, to the end user, but at the same time we also have an educational uh, prerogative, I think, to to make people understand how their data is being used and why it's being used and how they can influence it themselves. And therefore, I think we should also try to educate that audience and, and explain, or at least give them the option to understand mm -hmm. how the data was used. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts, or? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, as well, going back to that, uh, and it's kind of related to explainability, uh, explainable AI in a way as well, that, you know, for in the context of, of some task for some people, they just need a sort of yes, no answer at the end of the day, you're doing fine. Uh, and then in, in other cases, y you need some kind of explanation or, or the, the end user might want to know that and they might need that information. So it's, it's very kind of context uh, specific. Yeah, and, it, and I suppose a really well-designed system will tell you you're doing fine, but if you really want to drill down and only... 3% of people might, but they can drill down and say, okay, why are you saying that, you know, what, what's, doing, what's good and what's bad or what could be better? So having you know, that design. You know, I, I am an outlier here, I'm sure, because I actually think interpretability is a grave danger. I think more mm -hmm. harm has been done by paying attention to interpretability than by saying, okay, I'm going to make sure I have really good science around my black box. Um, but the <laughs> people really want insight, they really want interpretability, and uh, that innate human need, I think, has to be paid attention to whenever possible. So there are these interesting technologies out there now for helping people do locally linear models, at least, so they can explain what the sensitivity is at the point where you are on the model, you know, and there are laws in the U.S. that if you're to turn down for credit, you have to be told the five major reasons under your control that have anything to do with that. Um, and so these are very helpful forms of forcing some, at least some sort of interpretability on. But uh, in most of my experience, a lot of data modeling problems come from paying too much attention to interpretability because people fall in love with an interpretation they want and then they stop listening to the data. Okay. Once they, have, once they find something that they like, they, they pay attention to that and it's way worse than the model they could build if they would just let it go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can fall in love with the, the concept and start biasing your thinking. Just bias around, everything. Uh, the data, yeah, yeah I agree, I agree, that, that's true. And two more quick questions. Um, one is about uh, future skills needs. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about this this morning, but um, with, with all of this power of technology and, and modeling coming, and AI even coming into force, um, what do you think are critical skills we should be teaching our students and how do they can cope in this, in this world of data and AI? Any thoughts? Uh? Well, I think, I mean, there's a lot of discussion around, you know, Python or R or these, oh, yeah. these kind of technical yeah. skills, uh, which is important, it's obviously. Good, yeah. But I think underlying that, particularly in data science, is a curiosity and a sense of curiosity and questioning. Yeah. Uh, and to sort of foster that, yeah. um, that kind of approach, because, I mean, that leads to wanting to 
ask questions about the world mm -hmm. and then asking questions of data to, to find yeah, the answers. Yeah, like Python and Oral come and go, you know. <laughs> We've been through different technologies and languages, but uh, having that uh, ability to continuously learn. But how do you instill curiosity then is, is the next question I'd... I'd uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> well I, I mean, I, I think that probably has to come from kind of quite early yeah. stages um, in, in education. So, you know, young children should, you know, yeah. have the curiosity in, in, in that age group and then that builds out yeah. their lives. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Kim? I would like to add, as the flip side of curiosity, we also need skepticism. Okay. Um, in the sense that we can be curious and we can try models and, and we want to explore as much as we can, but then when something comes out, we have to be able to look at it and go, hmm, is that correct? Have I been biased somehow? Is there correlation when there's, is there causation when there's correlation? Uh, and be skeptical and really then try to twist our model around and see, have I made a mistake anywhere? So we need to... Uh, we need to have the curiosity to try things out, but then also take a step back and, in that scientific approach, really test yeah. the outcomes. Critical thinking, and I think yes, that's those a are, skill. Those are vital. Sure. And you can't do it alone, because if you'd have thought of a weakness in your model, you, it wouldn't be a weakness. So you have to have other people critique your model. Mm -hmm. And that means you have to have a culture where that's a good thing, mm -hmm. where you're not attacking the person when you attack their model. When, when the, you know, you have, I, I teach occasionally at the university and every now and then you get a student who's thankful for the marks that you give on their papers or their work. <laughs> Mostly they come up and negotiate in America. <laughs> I don't know if that's the way it is here, but in America they want those extra two points, you know. But, um, but every now and then the student realizes, oh my gosh, an expert has carefully read everything and has responded to the thing. So that's, the, that's a great sign. You want to hire that person. You know, the... The groups, if you have groups where people are free, mm -hmm. no matter the rank of the person with the idea to say, well, what about this? Have you thought about that? Did you turn the machine on? You know, various things. And it's not taken as an insult, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but it's, it's, a, it's welcomed as a way to make truth be found and yeah. success go forward because reality is going to kill your model. Mm -hmm. If you can't, you have, to, you have to work really hard to kill it in the lab. To, to avoid having it die out in reality. That's a great point, actually, yeah. And I think that peer programming kind of philosophy are, you know, Agile and Scrum, where there, people work in teams and they code review and they check, you know, it's a very powerful way of learning, and I think that is the future. So lastly, and then briefly, maybe we can... Um, last year, we talked about the singularity, and I love to talk about the singularity, so let's finish on that. The prospect of AI posing a threat to humanity by becoming even more powerful and self-replicating intelligence that even the humans uh, cannot understand. Yeah, the panel was largely skeptical last year. Good skeptics, as Kim, you know, uh, good thinking, obviously. Um, but there is a risk, uh, no matter whether it's 10, 20, 100, or 200 years away. Um, so I think we should just revisit that briefly. Uh, any signs the singularities around the corner are <laughs> becoming more of a threat than it was this time last year? John? <laughs> Well, if, if you remember the panel last year split, and actually in the audience talking later, mm. split completely by age. Okay. Anybody old like me said, no way. <laughs> Younger people said, of course. <laughs> you know, there are yeah. things not dreamed of in your philosophy. You know, uh, so I haven't changed my mind, but I am, I am uh, surprised. I mean, the AI, which by the way, when they say AI has solved Go and poker yeah. and driving, um, they're using data science. They're using inductive methods to do that. They're not using the traditional AI methods. So at least it's our side that's winning. But anyway, yeah. uh, um, I, I'm on record as saying never going to happen. Okay, sticking with it. Kim? <laughs> of course it's going to happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just, she just wants to go in with the, 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 the youth camp there. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I read so much sci-fi and I love it. And of course it's going to happen. But actually, <laughs> um, but, but, but my take on the singularity is that I actually think it can be a positive thing. Because I think we can then learn from them and it can help humanity move forward quicker than we could have otherwise. I mean, imagine that they start to build huge spaceships and, and we can sort of 
hop onto those spaceships like little rats. We can be the rats <laughs> of the next Columbus mission to the next stars, and we can get to go on these voyages. And and I think it can help humanity. Wow. It takes the pressure off us doing all the thinking, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's surprisingly good. You it, have yeah. you uh, cracked the artificial general intelligence down in UCD yet, Oshie? Yeah, we keep trying. <laughs> one of one of the things that uh, I've kind of noticed is maybe a bit more of a realization oh, more recently that kind of AI is sort of bigger and broader mm. than maybe we thought or people might have thought. So, you know, there's areas that, like, a lot of the modern machine learning, I mean, it's essentially correlations, pattern matching. Yeah. That's like one really small piece of the big AI picture. Yeah. Like causal inference, cause and effect, and, and these kind of areas. Um, I, I think there's been much more sort of information, and, and there's a number of books out in the last year actually looking at at these areas which have sort of been ignored and suddenly people realize hang on this ai thing's actually it's massive and it's there's much Broadly more to it yeah. maybe than than we've been talking about uh, recently so excellent all right but up or down was that we're gonna go yes, yes or, or no, no. it's gonna happen or maybe maybe <laughs> <laughs> okay so thank you very much to our panel okay. we'll leave it at that and i'll just say a few closing remarks so thank you very much all right thank to you the panel. <laughs> thanks Ashin.